Today we'll be reading the entirety of Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house ever singing your praise. Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of our Lord, and you may uh, be seated. Good morning. You guys doing well? Yes. Outstanding. Good to have you with us. Welcome to Desert Breeze Community Church. God's amazing promises for enjoying God's presence. That's what we're going to look at this weekend. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 84. These are my favorite verses. I've got a lot. Remember last weekend was not my favorite verses. It's actually my wife's favorite verses. But they were good verses. But these are my favorite verses, Psalm 84. It's a beautiful text. We're going to be working our way through it. You can follow along if you have your Bibles there in front of you. Also, grab your sermon notes out. We'll get started here. Take a look at the intro to the sermon notes. It is our highest privilege and our deepest pleasure. It is the key to happiness and holiness. It is what we were created for. Our whole life should be lived out of the fullness of it. It is what was lost in the garden and what Christ came to restore. God is most glorified in us and people are most attracted to him through us when we are most proficient in it. What is it? It's enjoying God's presence. Enjoying God's presence. Enjoying God's presence involves three things you can see there in your notes. It involves, first of all, desire. If you don't have desire to enjoy his presence, you're not going to experience his presence. So it starts with desire. We'll see this in the text. And then it goes from desire to discipline. There's certain disciplines we can do to help to increase our capacity to experience this uh, enjoying of God's presence. And then it, it ends with delight. So desire, discipline, delight. It's all right here in the text before we uh, unpack this text and uh, look at these notes. Uh, let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's just take a moment once again. Let's focus on God. Let's ask for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to illuminate this text to our hearts and our lives. Father God, your mercy has spared us. Your grace has saved us and your love satisfies us unlike anything else. Teach us this amazing blood-bought promise of enjoying your presence. Our hearts are forever restless until we find our rest in a personal experience of enjoying your presence in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' beautiful name and everyone said, amen. amen. So take a look at this, enjoying God's presence. First of all, desire. This is based on the first four verses. Let's kind of walk through these verses and just kind of savor what the writer here is saying, what God wants to speak to our hearts. Verse one, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Here's your first fill in the blank on your notes. So enjoying God's presence involves desire for a personal encounter with the living God. You'll notice that at the very end of verse 2. Joy to the living God. This is intense language of love poetry, a rapturous yearning to be with God. The psalmist cannot contain his emotions as he thinks about being with God. 
This is a holy love sickness for God and finds the courts of the temple to be beautiful, not so much for its architecture, but because God is there. Now, now this is more than a general belief in God. It's a personal encounter with the living God. I know I talk to a lot of people and they, they'll say, oh yeah, 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 I believe in God. No, this, isn't, this is way beyond that. It's more than just believing that there's a God in a general sense. No, this is an encounter. I'm telling you, this is an encounter with the living God. And there's nothing better. And, and I think it's important to understand this is the language that he's uh, helping us with here. And, and, and so, uh, as you think about connecting with God at this level, and this desire that you see in this text, uh, I was thinking about prayer. There's different kinds of prayer. There's different types of prayer. There's petitional prayer or supplication where we bring our, our request to God. And then there's uh, bringing our confession, confessional prayer. Uh, we confess, we share our problems, we confess our sins to God. And then there's adoration. That's another form of prayer. And it's really kind of important to understand the different kinds of prayer. But this is a much the, the deepest kind of prayer here. And so in a business relationship, you can make petitions, you make requests. And sometimes I, I've seen where people just, that's all they have in their relationship with God. They just go to God and make requests. And nothing wrong with that. You're just missing out on, on a much deeper, intimate, more intimate relationship with God, a more enjoyable relationship with God. So it's more than a business relationship where you just make petitions, make requests. And it actually goes deeper than just a friendship relationship where you, where you make confessions and friends will confess sins and share problems and, and that's an important part of your relationship with God. But this goes into a deeper level. In a love relationship, you give adoration. You give affirmation and praise. And so the deeper the love relationship, the more the conversation heads towards adoration. So, so most of your relationship with God, yes, you should bring your request, make petitions, and confess your faults and, and struggles and share your problems. And yet, where you sp should be spending most of your time is affirming and adoring and praising. That's that deeper level that we see here in Psalm 84. By the way, if you want really healthy relationships, I mean, think of a husband and wife marriage relationship. Think of friendship relationships. It's, they've got to actually go beyond petitions and confessions. If you want healthy relationships, they should go to the place of adoration, affirmation, and praise. I, when I look at my, my relationship with my wife, we have a lot of that, a lot of affirmation and praise. Yeah, we make requests, we share problems, but, but more than anything, it's a lot of adoration of one another. That's what nurtures our relationship. And, and that should even be more so true in your relationship with God. So that's kind of the beginning as it relates to this desire. Do you spend time telling God how much you love him and experience his love for you? Do you adore him? We'll talk more about that as we unpack these notes as we look at this. So this idea of enjoying God's presence is really throughout Scripture. In fact, I gave you quite a number of verses here. This is just a short list, but let me read through some of these. Rejoice in the Lord always, Psalm, or Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians 4.4. 4. In his presence is fullness of joy, Psalm 16.11. That was uh, the second to the last song we just sang. I love that song. That's a great song. I love this. This is another one of my favorite uh, chapters in Psalms. Psalm, Psalm 16, beautiful. In his presence is fullness of joy. And then that last song was Psalm 84 from this psalm that we're studying here this morning. Uh, you make me glad with the joy of your presence, Psalm 21.6. We feast on the abundance of your house and drink from your river of delight, Psalm 36.8. Delight yourself in the Lord, Psalm 37.4. Be glad in the Lord, Psalm 32.11. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? He's good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalm 34, 8. I will go to the altar of God, to my God, my exceeding joy, Psalm 43, 4. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually, Psalm 105, 4. I mean, this is just a short list. I mean, the Bible is packed full of verses that talk about us enjoying God, enjoying the presence of God. Now, you need to understand this is that in 1 John 4, 19 makes it very clear that we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Because he first loved us. And so it's his deep affection for us that stirs our affection for him. So we love him because he first loved us. When you begin to see the depth and the quality and the intensity of his affection for you, 
Oh my goodness, you won't be the same. You'll stir such passion for him. Unlike you've ever known. Our desire for God is nothing compared to his desire for us. God wants you to live and enjoy his presence. I mean, he sent his son on a rescue mission to this earth to die in our place for our sins, to reconcile us to himself so that we could live and enjoy his presence. This, this is why he came. This is so critical, so important to our life. See, Psalm 84 is the language of someone whose heart has been ravished by God's deep affection for us and is responding in return. I love what, uh, I think that uh, a guy by the name of Sam Storms captures that in his book. Let me just read a quote from his book. Uh, the title of the book is Pleasures Evermore, The Life-Changing Power of Enjoying God. Listen to what he says. We were made to enjoy him. Our minds were shaped and fashioned to think about God, to reflect and meditate on his majesty and beauty, and to experience the intellectual thrill of theological discovery. Now listen to this next statement he says here. Our emotions were made to feel his power, love, and longing for us. To feel his longing for us. Our wills were made to choose his will in ways. Our, spirit, our spirits were formed to experience the ecstasy of communion with him. Our bodies were fashioned to be the temple where he himself would delight to dwell. Love it. Verses 3 and 4, let's continue on. That's just the first two verses of this text. It's beautiful. It's breathtaking. So look at the verses 3 and 4. Now, he's speaking really metaphorically, really beautiful language here. He says, even the sparrow finds a home and the swallows a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, the word Lord, there is Yahweh, host, angel armies, I love the language here. It's just beautiful. He's already said that in this text. My king and my God. So a sparrow in the Bible is a symbol of worthlessness or insignificance. He's just saying, hey, even, even something as worthless and insignificant as a sparrow finds its home. And then a swallow, which is a symbol of restlessness and insecurity, even a swallow, a nest for herself. Uh, birds would often build nests under the eaves of the temple is where he's really getting this idea. So he's just looking, maybe as he's going through the temple, and as, he, as he's writing this out, he's just saying, wow, look, look at this. They find rest in you, God. And then he kind of ties it with the next verse. It goes along with this, this whole idea Blessed are those who dwell. By the way, the word blessed, and we throw that word around a lot, but the word means, and he uses it a number of times here, blessed, it means total fulfillment and complete well-being. I mean, there's just an internal fulfillment. You feel fulfilled, and it's just well-being. Everything's going to be okay. I, I just rest in him. So total fulfillment, complete well-being. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. What's the result of that? Ever singing your praise. So, so I, I, I like that. C.S. Lewis says, we praise what we enjoy. We praise what we enjoy. Praise not only expresses, but completes our enjoyment. Praise is inner health made, made audible. Think about the things that you enjoy. My wife and I took a trip to Prescott uh, Friday. And uh, if you guys are familiar with the downtown area where the courtyard is, you guys familiar with that? How many, by show of hands, are familiar with uh, Whiskey Row? Whiskey Row? Just how familiar are you to Whiskey Row? That's what I want to know. Okay. So at the end of Whiskey Row, Montezuma, there used to be a cigar shop over there. And now they've turned it into a barbecue. It's Colt's Barbecue. And so we went in there, and it's, um, it's, what do they call express dining? I like that. They give you an option between express dining or they'll wait on you. I kind of prefer express dining. It's because I'm a cheapskate. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's not why. But uh, it's just easier sometimes to get in there and get out and, and enjoy. But we're eating these uh, pulled pork sandwiches, and my wife and I are just like, you know, as you're enjoying something, obviously you're going to praise it. Oh, this is delicious. Oh, this is good. Oh, wow, man, we got to remember this place. We got to tell people about this place. I mean, so, so that's what, that's what C.S. Lewis is saying. So when we dwell in your house, they're ever singing your praise. We praise what we enjoy. 
Praise not only expresses but completes our enjoyment. Praise is inner health made audible. So when you're dwelling in his presence, you can't help but go, this is good. This is really good. And of course, as believers, you know, our praise doesn't terminate on the on the gift, it rolls on up to the gift giver because we know that, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, every good and perfect gift comes from God. So my wife and I are enjoying this with one another, praising this Colts barbecue place, but also it's an opportunity to connect with one another, but also with God in the reality of this. And that's what praise is. Praise is an expression of satisfaction. Here's your next fill in the blank. And so enjoying God's presence involves desire for a personal encounter with the living God, but also to make your home in God's presence. So that's what you have in verses 3 and 4. So you got the sparrow and the swallow makes their home in God's presence, so to speak. He's speaking metaphorically and and figuratively. But then in verse 4, he wraps it up. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. So to make your home in God's presence. Psalm 91.1, it uses this language. Um, Psalm 91.1, anybody familiar with that? Maybe you've memorized that? How does that go? You guys remember? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So that same language, dwells. You make your home in God. Oh my goodness, you're going to find sweet rest in Him. Uh, Psalm, uh, John 15, Jesus talks about, uses this word, abide in me, dwell in me, make your home in me, 10 times in 11 verses in John 15. So to come and go from God's presence is refreshing, but to live, to dwell, to abide in God's presence is heaven on earth. So this is the idea that he's talking about here. I want to dwell. I want to dwell in your presence. Now, there's a difference between the omnipresence of God, Psalm 139 talks about that, we see this throughout scripture, and the manifested presence of God. So Adam and Eve, when they were hiding in the garden, when God came into the garden in the cool of the day looking for them, they were hiding not from the omnipresence of God, they could never hide from the omnipresence of God, but they were hiding from the manifested presence of God. God comes into the garden and says, where are you? Where are you? So they were hiding from the manifested presence of God. Typically, sin will cause us to hide from the manifested presence of God. We don't want to be in his manifested presence because of, oftentimes we have guilt and shame, but, but that's the perfect place to be, to bring our guilt and shame to him. He's, he receives us with open arms, but our tendency is to push away from that. We also see in, in Isaiah 33, Moses is leading the nation of Israel through the wilderness into the promised land, and God says with Moses, hey, I'm not going any further. I'm going to have an angel lead you into the promised land. I'm going to still give, I'm going to still give you what I promised, but I'm not going to go with you because you guys are a stiff-necked, proud people, and I'll probably destroy you en route, and that won't be good. And, and so Moses says, hey, 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 wait a minute, God, wait a minute. We would rather, this is what Moses says, we would rather wander around in the wilderness with your presence than to go into the promised land without your presence. The promised land. Think of promised land, success, fortune, fame, all that. All the success in this world has nothing on what we have in you in your presence. What is he talking about? He's talking about not the omnipresence of God. He's talking about the manifested presence of God. So there's a major difference between the omnipresence of God. You can't run from that, but you can kind of run and push away and and you can have an experience of the manifested presence of God where he becomes more real than any problem or trial you're facing or any temptation that you're up against. There's just just a sense of his presence. In fact, this is kind of how I've defined it. When we make our home, when we abide, dwell, and live in God's presence, it is a habitual, conscious communion, communication, conversation with God. So enjoying God's presence becomes really the passion, the purpose, the priority, the preoccupation. That's the key word, preoccupation of our life. So I, I, I hope that you have, you know, you spend time with the Lord maybe in the morning or noon or afternoon, whenever is the best time for you. But you don't leave God there, do you? I mean, you sit down, you talk with him, you interact with him, you 
you read his word, you pray, you don't leave him there. And I hope that you don't leave God here when you leave here. But you go out with him because he's always with you because you're cultivating and you're almost kind of practicing his presence. You have a, a sense of his presence with you. He indwells you. He loves you. You're, you're just kind of walking in the reality of the fact that you can interact with him. You can talk with him. You can converse with him anytime, anywhere, any place, 24-7. Nothing quite like that. That's what happens when we begin to enjoy his presence. We don't relegate him to a, a, a time or a place or just through our devotional time, but we, we walk throughout the day with him knowing he's with us, he loves us, allowing him to lavish you with his love, to liberate you with his truth as he speaks to your heart, to lead you with his presence, speaking to you as you, you share your heart with him, you interact with him. I'll talk more about that as we work through the notes of, of how I do that, how I'm able to enjoy that, and how you can do the same. But that's, that's part of this. So home is a place where we feel significant, secure, and satisfied. In fact, that's the next three fill in the blanks. To make your home in God's presence is to find your ultimate significant security and satisfaction. I mean, that's what verses 3 and 4 are saying. When you look at the sparrow, which is a symbol of worthlessness and significance, it's basically saying, hey, we can find our significance by making our home, by enjoying his presence, we can find our security, which uh, swallow is a symbol of restlessness and insecurity. So he's saying we find security there. And then in verse 4, he says, those that are dwell in his presence are ever praising him. He's speaking of satisfaction. So significance, security, and satisfaction. You feel significant, so you're cultivating this intimacy with God. You're walking through the day with Him. You're interacting with Him. You're talking to Him. He's speaking to you. You're practicing His presence. You feel significant because He lavishes you with His love. And, and nothing will make you more unoffendable. People that are living in the reality of this, they almost become unoffendable because they feel the value and the worth that God places upon them. He lavishes us with, with his love. It makes us feel significant. This eliminates bitterness over the past. And then you feel secure because he liberates you with his truth. As you begin to understand his truth, it just brings such freedom. You become unshakable. I mean, that eliminates any complaining about the present as you're just liberated by his truth. And then, and then you feel satisfied because he leads you with his presence. You become, really, nothing will make you more unstoppable as he's leading you and guiding you. You can almost, really, you can face anything as he's leading you. And this eliminates any worry about the future because he's with you. There's nothing better than enjoying his presence. People, things, and circumstances get the best of us because we are not finding our ultimate significant security and satisfaction in God, in enjoying his presence for our life. So enjoying God's presence involves desire for a personal encounter with God and to make your home in God's presence. That's the first part. Now, this desire moves to discipline, and that's what we see in verses 5 through 9. So there's things that we can do to nurture this desire. Look at verse 5. Bless, there's that word again, total fulfillment, complete well-being. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. So here's what's fascinating about this. Pilgrimages to the tabernacle were grand, a grand feature of the Jewish life. So just as they would annually journey to the tabernacle to celebrate the feast, we must journey to cultivate our relationship with God through spiritual disciplines. Here's your next fill in the blank. So discipline is a journey that begins in the heart through spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. It says this. It says physical training is of some value. It's good. It's good to work out. It's good to exercise. It's good to take care of your body physically. And some of you might need to do that more than others, okay? I'm just, I'm just saying. It's okay. We could say that. We could, it's good to, the Bible encourages that. And it's a, it's a value that my wife and I have for our lives. And, but, but it says, in contrast, that's good, that's good, but not as good as spiritual training. That's what that verse says. So spiritual training has value not only for this life, but for the, also the life to come. It's even greater. So yeah, we discipline ourselves physically, but he says, but spiritual discipline is even of greater value. That's what we're talking about here. 
So it is a journey, so discipline is a journey that begins in the heart through spiritual discipline. So what, is, what are spiritual disciplines? Here's how I want you to think about spiritual disciplines. We're talking about Bible study, prayer, what you're doing right now, hanging out with other Christians in a small group setting. So what are spiritual disciplines? Those are those things that you do that increases your capacity to enjoy the presence of God in your life, to experience more of Him in your life. So what are the things that you do this stirs your heart for Christ and increases your capacity to experience more of Him. What are those things? I can tell you the things that I do each and every day. Oh my goodness. I, I, I long, I long to experience His presence in my life. I, I understand the uh, omnipresence of God. I want the manifested presence. I want to interact with Him. I want to know that He's with me and He loves me. I want to experience His love. I want Him to lead me with His presence. I want Him to liberate me with His truth. I, I want all that. And I'm sure you do too. So what are those things that you do to help to increase you in that? And in fact, discipline, and you've heard me use this before too as a definition for sacrifice. Uh, discipline of sacrifice is giving up something you love for something you love more. So what are you willing to give up in your life so that you can start doing things that will increase your capacity to enjoy God's presence? Important question. Listen to what Jonathan Edwards says. We should endeavor by all possible means to inflame our desires and to obtain more spiritual pleasures. Our thirst and hunger for God, Jesus Christ and holiness can't be too great for the values of these things for they are things of infinite value. Remember what we said, physical training is of some value. Spiritual training has value for this life and the life to come. It's infinite, it's eternal. That we would do those things, those disciplines that would increase our capacity to experience more of God in our life, the pleasure we find in Him. He says this, this is how he ends it. Therefore, endeavor to promote spiritual appetites by laying yourself in the way of allurement. You hear the language? So how, how do you, what do you put in front of you? What are the things that you feast on, whether it be uh, sermons or Bible studies or time in prayer or worship music that stirs your appetite to want to know Christ and to experience Him? So there are things that I do daily, spiritual disciplines, that's my goal is to stir my heart for Jesus. That's our goal every weekend. That when you come in here, we don't want to, I, I mentioned it last week, there are a lot of churches sometimes they'll just give you something to do rather than a person to enjoy. I want to give you a person to enjoy every week and I want to teach you how to enjoy him, how to know him. The living God, an encounter with the living God, this is what he's talking about here. There's nothing better, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, I, I'll tell you, let me just say this, that I, there's no way I would have survived ministry for 31 years if I hadn't cultivated this, if I hadn't spent a lot of time, a considerable amount of time just enjoying his presence. I love his presence. It's my favorite thing I do every day, by the way. I love enjoying his presence. And I don't know what I would do. I would have not survived if it hadn't been for that discipline. And that, it started with desire. I had this desire and then it, it, and then you know, it came out and through a discipline in my life. And so as I continue to discipline myself in this, it just stirs and stokes the flame in my heart. I hope that happens here. If it doesn't happen here, you need to find a church where it does happen in your heart. That your heart is just stoked with a fire for Christ and to know him and to have a passion for him. So look at verses six and seven. So as they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. This is really fascinating what he's saying here. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Now, a valley in the Bible often symbolizes really lowness, darkness, adversity, even dryness. Like, you know, we all go through these times in our spiritual life where I'm not getting it, I'm not feeling it. There's nothing here. It seems bland. It seems boring. Here's what I found is that those that are seasoned in the Lord realize that most of their growth didn't happen in good days, but in bad days. Would you guys agree with that? 
Yeah, most of your spiritual growth is going to happen during hard days, bad days, dry days, difficult days. And you're going to press on through that. And through that, the roots of your life are going to go deeper into God. You're going to begin at some point as you get through that. Notice what he says here. This is fascinating. And as they go through the valley of Baca, dryness, adversity, difficulty, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. So the tendency, and I've heard people say this, I'm not getting anything out of my devotion, so I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, that's insane. By not doing it anymore, you're certainly not going to ever get anything out of your devotions, okay? So don't stop. Don't stop spending time with him. Continue to press on. And as you grow and you mature, you're going to realize, oh my goodness, that was a really necessary part of my growing in Christ. In fact, that was very much needed. And what I found, once again, I found that I grow deeper sometimes during the dry times and the difficult times and the suffering in my life than what I ever have during the good times in my life. This is the point that he's making. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Those whose strength is in God make it a place of springs. So now this is what we need to understand is you've got to kind of see where are you this morning? And you're in one of these three stages as it relates to your desire for God. First stage is you have no desire for God. So what would you do? You repent that you have no desire for God. That's your next fill in the blank. Maybe that's where you are. So you repent. I got, I have no desire for you. I don't even know what this guy's talking about. He gets all worked up every weekend, gets all passionate. I think he's a nut job anyway. So God, I just don't know what's going on. I, yeah, I understand that. Some of you are shaking your head. Yep, he, he's a nut job. I'm cool with that. I could care less whether you call me a nut job. I love Jesus. I love what I have in him. And nothing could ever take that away. I love enjoying his presence. So you repent of no desire for God. Or maybe you have desire for God, but it's, you're not fulfilling it. You just have this deep passion for him, but it's, it's been a while since you've had an experience of it on your heart. So you got repent of no desire, desire for God, or desire for God fulfilled. Maybe this morning, man, you had an encounter with God. You had a desire. You came in here with a desire. And during the worship time, as we were singing those last couple of songs, Psalm 16, Psalm 84, woo! You felt like that God met with you. You had a sense of his presence on your heart. Maybe that's where you are. Now, let me kind of walk you through some thoughts here to, as we kind of unpack this to see where we might be. Where are you in one of those three places? And, and all of us will be in one of those three places in our life from time to time. If God's worth and value shines most brightly in people who enjoy his presence most deeply, if that's true, I believe that's true, if God's worth and value shines most brightly in people who enjoy his presence most deeply, then indifference in apathy to enjoying his presence is indifference and apathy to his worth and value. Does that make sense? So if I'm indifferent about enjoying his presence, then I'm indifferent about his worth and value. Because the best way that I can demonstrate his worth and value in my life is to enjoy his presence and to want to have him in my life and to experience him in my life more and more. Imagine, let me give you some illustrations here. Imagine my wife give, giving me a gift. Just say, just imagine her giving me a gift because she really never does. <laughs> it's really kind of hurtful, actually. Actually, she gives me a lot of gifts, but, uh, but just imagine me. In, in fact, I, we've got this uh, agreement. We don't give each other a lot of gifts. It's really not our love language, but, uh, and I've told her that, you know what, I just love being with you. I would rather have your presence than any present from you. And that's always been my heart. I just love being with her. And I, and I feel that even more so with God. I, just, I love his presence more than anything that I would ever get from him. I've gotten plenty from him to last me the rest of my life all the way into eternity. When you understand what you have in Jesus Christ just through his presence, that's enough. But imagine she gives me a gift and I find greater pleasure in the gift than I do in her, the giver. It's kind of like I push her out of the way and says, okay, okay thank, thank you for the gift. Okay, go ahead and leave. Because I just want to hang out with this gift. Would that be weird? Well, I, would, I wouldn't do that. I, I would never do that. I, I love being with her and I, I love enjoying. Oftentimes we are, we are like a two or three year old at Christmas time preferring the gift over the giver. And that's our culture. It's called idolatry. 
In fact, there is no gift from God that even comes close to the gift of God. Don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. James 1, 16 through 17. So, whatever pleasure you are getting from his gifts is nothing compared to what, what you will get from enjoying his presence. And, and so, so, what happens is that what helps me to come to what is known as sweet repentance, when I, when I feel bored with God or when I feel like I, I have no desire for him, I, I come back to this idea that not only uh, my apathy to, or uh, as I said here, indifference to experiencing and enjoying his presence is showing apathy and um, indifference to his worth and value, but anytime I find more excitement and energy in his gifts over and above him, the gift giver, it convicts me. It brings sweet repentance because it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And so when I, whatever joy you're experiencing in the gift, the Bible's telling us over and over again, every good and perfect gift comes from God. It's, it's, it's a gift from God, a pointer to God. You think you're finding pleasure in that gift? It. It's a dim glimpse of what you'll experience in him. I love the presence of my wife, and she is a gift from God to me, but a pointer back to God who, where I really enjoy his presence even that much more. Nothing against my wife, but that should be true with all of us. There is no gift from God that even comes close to the gift of God. So let me ask you this. Do you find more pleasure in the gifts of God more so than God. In whatever pleasure you're finding, it's meant to stir your heart to point you back to Him. So when you see something that's beautiful or glorious or breathtaking, all it's saying to you is like, hey, wake up. He's even more beautiful, glorious, and breathtaking. And that's a gift from God to get your attention, to draw your heart to Him so that you can know him and experience him. I mean, my wife and I enjoyed that pulled pork sandwich. It was big, it was hearty, we cut it in half. We had a big old plate of fries. Woo, baby, we're eating it. We're looking out the window there. It was only about 85 degrees there when it was 150 here, okay? We were soaking it up, but, but in that praise and worship, we were using that as an opportunity for, for our praise and adoration to roll on up to God to say, wow, God is so good to us. He loves us. This is not to be confused with God himself. Thank you for these gifts, but we don't want to be guilty of idolatry, loving the gifts more than we love you, God. We love you even more. So it becomes a, a, an experience of, of God enjoying him. Listen, to, uh, as one pastor theologian put it, if we don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because we have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because we have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Our soul is stuffed with small things and there is no room for the great. If we are full of what the world offers, then perhaps a fast might express or even increase our soul's appetite for God. My wife and I don't do a lot of TV watching. We'll go to movies and we'll watch some stuff here and there. We don't watch a lot of news. We just enough to kind of keep us informed of what's going on. We spend more time really with each other and with God, communing with him, enjoying him, loving him. We want our hearts to be stirred for him. Because there's nothing more satisfying. Nothing absolutely more satisfying. So maybe, just maybe, if you haven't had that experience in your life, maybe you need to fast a few things in your life. Maybe that's what God's speaking to you this morning. So that's part of that discipline, having that spiritual discipline. Now, now how do we do that? How do we bridge that gap? How do we move beyond these three stages from repenting of no desire to desire to desire for God fulfilled? Here's the next part. Look at verses 8 and 9. He does really a great job with this. He says, Oh, Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear. Oh, God of Jacob, Selah, think and reflect on this. Behold our shield. Oh, God, look on the face of your anointed. Here's your next fill in the blank. I think it's based on verses 8 and 9. 
So how we, how we stir that up within us? How can I ex- enjoy his presence? The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. That's your fill in the blank, in truth. That's Psalm 145, 18. So what is this idea of calling on the Lord in truth? Well, I think he does a good job in verses 8 and 9. So truth, to call on the Lord in truth means, first of all, we approach him based on how he has revealed himself to us. That would be consistent with the revelation we find of God, defining God from his word. So we we approach him based on uh, his attributes as revealed through his word. I hear people from time to time say, well, I prefer to see God like this. Well, it doesn't matter what you prefer to see God like. He says, not based on you. You don't define God. God defines himself. He's already done that. It's in his word. So it doesn't matter what you say. That's why he's saying you want to you encounter the living God, you've got to approach him based on his attributes, based on who he is. In fact, he makes it very clear. He says, oh, Lord God. The word Lord obviously is Yahweh. Lord God of hosts, angel armies. He's talking about God's greatness. That God is mighty. But notice the balance here. He says, hear my prayer, give ear, O God of Jacob. So he goes from God being great and mighty to the goodness and merciful of God because he's speaking of Jacob. God was, was good and merciful to, to Jacob. So you got this phenomenal balance of the attributes of God because I come around people and I know, I know people that all they want to emphasize, I, I was with some folks not too long ago, and all they wanted to talk about was God's judgment, God's holiness, God's righteous. I got that, man. I got it. But guess what? God's also gracious and merciful and loving and you sound a little bit out of balance. You got to balance it out here. And so there are a tendency for churches to be focused on his judgment and righteousness and holiness. And then there's churches that will go to the other extreme. Oh, it's all about grace and love and mercy. How about both, okay? How about having a balance of both? Because you actually need both if you're going to have healthy psychology as it relates to your interaction with God. And, and, and really, that's what you have it in verse 8. You've got both his greatness and his goodness. His mighty, he's mighty and he's merciful. You see, his greatness without his goodness is terrifying. His goodness without his greatness is impotence. He's good, but if he's not great, he can't help me. So his might and mercy combined produces in us a humble confidence. It eliminates pride and fear. That's healthy psychology as we interact with God. So how do we do? So the Lord is near to all. That idea near is really encountering, enjoying the living God, enjoying his presence. So the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. So the first aspect of his truth here is according to his attributes. But we also see in verse 9, behold our shield, O God, look at the face of your anointed. What does he mean by that? Anointed would be King David. And we know that Old Testament King David represents King Jesus. Because from the line of King David came King Jesus. He's actually referring to, kind of speaking prophetically, looking into the future of Jesus. And we know this, that if we are going to call on him in truth, there's no way that you can have a relationship with God apart from Jesus. Did you guys know that? You knew that? Yeah, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. See, your sin separates you from God, and there's not a thing you can do to bridge the gap that separates you from God, but Jesus did that for you because he died in your place for your sins to bridge the gap between you and him. Amazing. Our intimacy with God is blood-bought. And so it's only through Jesus. That was John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's only through Christ that we can. So that's what it means to approach him in truth. So based on his attributes, based on Jesus, but also there's something about just being sincere and pure in our devotion to Christ. Truth means just honesty and humility. In fact, it tells us in 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul writes that I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, that somehow your hearts may be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. You know what sincerity means? It means you're not just robotically reading the Bible and praying. It means you have an authentic relationship. with You're pouring your heart out to him. That's what he's doing here. Your heart, you're trying to touch the Father's heart with your heart so that he can touch your heart. And you have that 
an authenticity, a realness. You're sharing what's going on in your heart. That's why I love the Psalms. 150 Psalms, raw emotion, nothing like it. So there's an authenticity, but there's also a purity. You recognize that there are things in your life that are competing for your heart's deepest loyalties and affections away from God. So you're aware of that. You know that. And so sincere and pure. Purity means undivided. God, I know that there's things that I try to, I, oftentimes I love your gifts more than I love you. So Lord, help me with that. And you're being honest. And I'm telling you, when you're honest like that, God begins to speak to us. Be real with God and he'll be real with you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you, as James says. So there's something that begins to happen in your heart. And so that's truth. But he says, call on him. So the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Call on him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Hebrews 11, 6, it says, without faith it is impossible to please God for whoever would come to him must believe that he exists and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Amazing. Here's what I typically do. This This is how I cultivate intimacy with God and as I walk through the day with him. I I typically will read somewhat for distance. I try to get completely through the Bible in one year. But what I'm looking for is for him to speak to me through a particular text of Scripture. So I'll I'll go for distance, but I'm really actually going more for depth. And so there'll be a verse that'll pop off the page like that to me. And then I will take that. I will oftentimes write it down. And I'll turn that into conversation with God. So I'll take a text of Scripture as I'm working through it in the morning. So it goes from knowledge. He'll speak to me a particular text. Here's a text that I wrote down here this last week that meant a lot to me. John 15, 9. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And he says to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. So that was one of those verses that just went, Oh, You mean to tell me? So I turn this back into conversation with God. God, are you saying here? Are you saying? So I begin to speak this to my heart. I share this with others. But more importantly, I use it as a form of communication to God. God, you're telling me that as you love Jesus, Jesus loves us. And I know that you delight, you love, you adore Jesus. So that means that he loves and delights and adores us. Help me to learn how to abide in your love. Let me just bask in the reality of that love. May it transform my heart. So I'll go from knowledge. He begins to speak to my heart. Conversation. That begins to stir up this kind of inspiration in, in my life. This, it begins to inspire me to go, go deeper. I'll say, God, God, thank you for that. Tell me more. Tell me more. Help me to understand that. This is my conversation I'm having with God. I'm interacting with God. He begins to inspire me to go deeper, giving me the capacity to resist sin and endure suffering. And then that leads to this, what is known as a kind of a transforming joy. This is the kind of intimacy that we can have with him. So knowledge, conversation, illumination, as he begins to give greater insight into that text, inspiration, he inspires you, he moves you, he stirs you to transforming joy. This is about turning the Bible into a conversation with a person. That's what I basically teach in our how to study the Bible. One of the many things that we do is, is not just reading it, but, but just understanding it and, and having interaction, dialogue uh, with God through that. So enjoying God's presence involves desire for a personal encounter with God, making your home in his presence. Discipline is a journey that begins in the heart through spiritual disciplines, moving us from from no desire to desire to fulfill desire by calling on the Lord in truth. Now we come, uh, this is probably the best part of the text. I mean, it's all good, but this is the best part, and we don't have any time, and so it's all over, and so I'm going to go ahead and pray, and you guys are out of here. No, we're going to go ahead. I'm going to run through it really quickly. But look at delight, verses 10 through 12. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God, notice the contrast here, than dwell in the tents of wickedness. What he's saying here, he's actually describing all the fortune and fame of people that don't know God is like a temporary temporary dwelling place. It's a tent. It's it's fleeting. It's not going to last. I would rather have your presence. I'd rather enjoy you more than all the success that they have in this world. So here's your next fill in the blank. Here's the delight. Enjoying God's presence is life's most satisfying reality. Bam, that's it. That's the essence of the Christian life. It's blood bought. You can experience that 24-7. You can enjoy him. 
That's ours. And, and I would encourage you to, to nurture that. And I gave you some verses there to help you with that. One day, enjoying his presence is better than a thousand experiencing anything else. What is your favorite vacation spot? Where's your favorite vacation spot? Now imagine, imagine three years there. Because that's what he's talking about. A thousand days, close to three years. Imagine three years there, fully paid. He's just saying that's nothing compared to one day in the presence of God. He goes on and says, enjoying God's presence really is what he's saying in this promise. Enjoying God's presence will give you what you can never get out of romance, money, achievements, career, acquisitions, vacations. The list goes on. He's really also saying in verse 10, the lowest position with God is infinitely better than living in luxury without him. By the way, these guys were the doorkeepers in the house of God that, that are writing this. That's why they can say that. Better, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. That's what they were. They're the doorkeepers. They're writing this psalm. Doorkeeper in the house of God. Then they're dwelling with all the wealth and the riches of this world. What we have in Christ is so much better. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, God's worst is better than the devil's best. Yes. Now, listen to me. If you believe this, if you believe verse 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wickedness. If you believe that, if it gets a hold of your heart, I'm telling you, it will stir up desire in you and you will have no problem with discipline in your life when it comes to nurturing your spiritual life. Because you will do those things. You will eliminate things in your life. Yeah, you'll let go of things you love for things you love more, like him. Because you want to experience more of him in your life. And then he kind of wraps it up in verses 11 and 12. I mean, uh, listen to what he says. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Verse 12. O Lord of hosts, blessed. Total fulfillment, complete well-being is the one who trusts in you. Satan's goal is to keep us in the dark about God's true feelings and intentions for us. In fact, verses 11 and 12 contradict the lies Satan told in the garden. Hey, listen, listen, if you obey God, if you follow God, if you serve God, you're not gonna be happy. He's holding out on you. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. Verses 11 and 12 cancels that out completely. Here's your last couple fill in the blanks. You can trust his goodness because he always, he always has your best interest at heart. Sin is what we do when we're not satisfied with God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean upon your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him. The word acknowledge, cultivate intimacy with him. Enjoy his presence, and he will direct your paths. Next weekend, God's amazing promises for healing our wounded heart. We're going to talk about Psalm 103. You can read that ahead. We won't cover the whole chapter. We'll cover parts of that chapter, great chapter. I'll be up front at the end of the service along with any available elders. If you're new, we'd love to meet you. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. If you've got any questions, we'd love to try to answer those questions for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. So, Father God, for a day enjoying your presence is better than a thousand anywhere else. Serving you in the lowest position is better than living in luxury without you. May these truths become a reality in our lives, moving us to, to greater desire for you and greater discipline in our time with you, giving us a greater delight in you that fills us with a significance and security and satisfaction unlike we could find anywhere else in this world. We pray these things in Jesus' beautiful name and everyone said, amen. amen. Love you guys.